please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Turn us against yourself, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us. Only then will we be saved. You brought Israel from Egypt like a great one. You drove away the nations and transplanted them into your land. You cleared the ground for your people. They took root and filled the land. And now our walls are broken down. The wild boar from the forest devours it. Wild animals feeds on it. Make your face shine upon us. Look from heaven and see our plight. Take care of this great one. Turn us again to yourself, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us. Only then will we be saved.
By the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I, a called and ordained servant of Christ, forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O oh God, make your face shine upon us. Jews and folly to the Gentiles. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior. In Prado Museum in Madrid, Spain, you will find a stunning masterpiece. It's from the 17th century Spanish artist Francisco Zervaro. He painted it in 1635. This piece of art is called Agnes Day. We remember that and we've heard that phrase or that term in part of our liturgy. It means simply in Latin, the Lamb of God. Tonight, I want to draw our attention to this amazing piece of artwork. I want you to look at it closely. It depicts a woolly merino lamb. It's lying on its side on a gray slab. As you look at the lamb, you'll notice it's facing left. He has these wonderfully curved horns that, that are consistent with its breed. All four of the feet have been tied together, bound above the ankles with two strands of cord. You notice you can't see the nut. With his feet tied together, the lamb's back has now become hunched over and elevated as it lies on the slab. The left eye, the only one that we can see, is open. Its eyelashes indicate a delicate eye line that we can look at. And if you look closely at the eye, you can see that the lamb is looking down at the slab on which he lays. There is no blood in this painting. So from that we can assume that this lamb is still alive. But he won't be for long. In the 17th century, still life paintings like this rarely displayed emotion. They were generally stoic, emotionless paintings. But that's not the case with this particular piece of artwork. That's not true with the Agnes Day. This lamp, if you look at it long enough, you can see there is an emotion that he's experiencing. The emotion is not one that many of us like to experience. You might call it resignation. He isn't struggling to get free. He isn't kicking and screaming. He isn't putting up a fight. He knows what's coming. He's prepared for his fate. This lad, in this painting, is ready to die. A couple other things about this particular piece of art. Notice where the light shines down from above in the corner. And it leaves only the lamp lighted and the slap, nothing in the background. Beyond that pool of light, it's dark. In fact, it's completely dark. The obvious day. Tonight we come to the penultimate, the second to the last in our series on the book of Exodus. Today we're going to look at Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to hear about the obvious day, the Lamb of God. Again, from our text, Exodus 12, verse 3, God tells Moses, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The lambs you choose, the animals you choose, must be one year old and without defect. This is the Passover lamb we've come to know. It must be a male. It must be perfect. The lamb that was chosen for this particular fate cannot be crippled. It cannot be lame. It can't have any illnesses or diseases. It can't be spotted. It can't even have an off color to it. This is a very special, defined as perfect lamb for each family in Israel. And after the family has gone and chosen, just the right lamb that meets all of the qualifications. 
expectations, all of their expectations, then they're to take that lamb and watch it for three days. For three days. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, that three-day watching period. Then, on the 14th day of the month, the entire nation of Israel, two to six million people, are to gather outside of their homes just as the sun is going down, almost this time at night, and do something extraordinary. All over the entire land, every family, every father and wife, child, son and daughter, and all of them are gathered around this lamb they've had in their home for three days. This perfect lamb. This chosen one. And what are they to do? Kill it. Slaughter it. Slit its neck and collect its blood. That's what it says in verse 7 of our text. Then they took some of the blood and they put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses. And inside, they ate the lamb. You see, this isn't just any lamb. This isn't just another meal. This isn't just any sacrifice. They've done all those things before. This is the obvious day. This is the Lamb of God. And the blood of this Lamb will set the people free. Free from their sin, free from their darkness, free from death. Look again at the obvious day. The black background serves a very distinctive purpose. Because the, black, the background is black, it emphasizes the light of the lamb's wool. It reminds us that this lamb is perfect. This lamb has no defects, no blemishes, no faults. The dark background, it does something else. It also points out why this lamb has to be slaughtered. In that darkness, in that blackness, we find the reason that this lamb must die. Martin Luther famously called it in curvatus in se. In curvatus in se. It's a Latin phrase, and it means turned in on itself. And that's what happens in the darkness. We turn in on ourselves. We turn in on our own interests, our own desires, our own needs, our own agendas, our own sense of right and wrong. We live in that darkness, in that complete and total absence of the light. The incurvatus in sin is what we call sin. In America, we call it rugged individualism. In psychology, they call it narcissism. In the church, we call it selfishness. But whatever you call it, God calls it sin. And sin is the absence of light. Sin is the total darkness, the very, very, very black darkness. Now, some would suggest that to look outwards toward God or others makes you vulnerable. It's too risky. You might get hurt. If you open yourselves up, if you let yourself be out there, some will take advantage of you. You'll be disappointed. You'll be frustrated. You'll be let down. You'll lose. So it's much better. It's safer. It's more comforting to hold it in, to turn in on yourself. And so, too many times, we lead our lives in a tight, fetal position, <coughs> almost like the obvious thing. It leads to isolation, <coughs> disconnectedness, and this 
despair. Sin, incurvatus in se, re seduces us. It traps us. And if not corrected, it kills us. If you've ever taken an art appreciation class, I had to take one as a sophomore in college. I hated it. With all due respect, except for this one picture. One of the things our professor said that if you really want to understand a piece of art, you should try to get inside the art. Put yourself in the picture. Put yourself in the painting. Try to understand what's going on. Imagine that you're walking along on a starry, starry night in Vincent van Gogh's masterpiece. Or perhaps you can think of yourself as sitting, listening to Mona Lisa as she sits for her poor famous portrait of Leonardo by Leonardo da Vinci. If you put yourself in this picture, if you were standing just at the edge of that gray slab, what would you do? How would you respond to this masterpiece, Agnes Day? I think many of us would have the impulse to let the lad go, to untie him, to free him, to allow him to escape what is certainly an unpleasant experience, after all. He's a cute lad. He looks so cuddly and innocent, so kind and loving. This lad doesn't deserve to die. I think that's a fair expression for many of us if we were in this painting. But I noticed, I mentioned early on, that you can't see the knot on his feet. And there's a reason for that. The knot is out of sight because this lamb cannot be let go. This lamb cannot be freed. There is nothing that this lamb can do. This lamb has to be slaughtered. This lamb must die because only by the blood of this lamb can you not live. Again, we go back to Exodus chapter 12. The lot blood will be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This blood of this lamb is our freedom. But this isn't the only lamb that bled. <clears throat> Spring forward 1,500 years. The lamb's blood flowed again but not on a gray slab, this time in a dark garden, <coughs> one we call Gethsemane. Jesus was in such agony. As he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, it says that he prayed that sweat and blood poured from his forehead. And you can be sure that when the Roman soldiers blindfolded Jesus, when they began to punch him and beat him, when they struck him in the face that he had a bloody nose and cracked lips, his blood flowed more. And then, then when they got done abusing him, they placed upon his head that crown of thorns, and it scraped his scalp and dug into his body, and more blood flowed. But the real bloodbath had not yet begun. That wouldn't take place for a little while, a little while longer. And it would happen on Golgotha, where the Savior stripped naked, where he was whipped violently without mercy, and the blood flowed from his open wounds on his back. And then they placed upon him the cross, and they made him carry that cross the several miles of what we now call the Via Della Rosa, the road of sorrow, the way of sorrow. And when they finally got to the place of his execution, they drove the nails through his hands and his feet. But the blood wasn't done flowing. It wasn't until that Roman soldier went and thrust his spear into his side that the blood finally continued to flow mixed with water. That Lamb of God, that obvious day, shed his blood. What's really amazing about this piece of art is that it, at its time, inspired another piece.
piece of art. Not one done in painting, but a marble sculpture. This one was done by Stefano Moderno, another Italian <coughs> sculptor. This one he calls the Saint Cecilia. Moderno draws on Zerban's uncanny capacity to capture the texture, the sense of what's taking place. It was a calculated, intentional, direct idea to replicate in stone what was done in colors, the shadows. It helps us to draw our attention on Saint Cecilia. She, like the lamb, is lying down. She, like the lamb, has her arms tied together. She, like the lamb, is resigned to God's will in her life. But there's another connection between Saint Cecilia and the Agnes Day. Can you see it? Can you figure it out? It's the most important connection of all. It's the white. It's the color. Saint Cecilia is all white, just like the lamb. And what does this mean? What is the purpose of that? What was the intent? In this picture, we see someone who's not white by their own desire or design, but someone who has been washed and made white by the blood of the Lamb. The white that we see in St. Cecilia has been washed in the blood of the Lamb, made clean by God's shedding of his blood. And what's incredible about that? is that's all of us. That portrait of Saint Cecilia is every one of us. We too have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We too surrender ourselves to the will of God in our lives. His blood has covered us, and by faith, we are clean. By faith, we have been set free, free in eternity, free from the incurvatus in say that turning in on itself, free from the sins of thought, word, and deed, all because we were washed in the blood of the Lamb. And in the end, at the very end, the blood was all that Jesus had. His disciples had run away and deserted him. His clothes had been gambled away by casting lots. We even hear Jesus from the cross reminding us that his father has turned his back on him. My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? All that our Lord had left was the blood. But you see, that's all we ever need. The blood is all we need. The blood of Jesus that cleanses us and makes us white. The blood of our Lord who washes our robes and makes them new. It is the blood that God gives to us. It's almost as if we're singing that wonderful hymn, Love So Amazing, Love So Divine. It demands my soul, my life, my all. Because God had another idea. Not just a lamb from a pen in the nation of Israel helping escape Egypt, but a lamb from the very realms of heaven, a lamb that came down to us and offered himself and his blood that we might be white.
I receive the supplications and prayers which we offer before you and for all the servants of your holy church, that every member of the same may truly serve you according to your calling. Everlasting God, the consolation of the, of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, may the prayers of those who are in tribulation or distress cry to you, graciously come before you. Especially remember the prayers on behalf of the family of Sherry Frank, who now spends eternity at her eternal home with you, through Jesus Christ. Everlasting God, because you seek not the death, but the life of all, hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you. Free them from their error. For the glory of your name, bring them into fellowship with your holy church. Almighty everlasting God, King of glory, Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed, by whose providence all things are ordered, the God of peace and the author, author of all concord, grant us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and concord, that we may serve you in true fear to the praise and glory of your name. Everlasting Father, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies and do good to those who hate us and to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation all our enemies may be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord, one mind and heart with us and with the whole church on earth. Heavenly Father, by your word you created and you continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you so to reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his dwelling in our hearts, we may by your grace be made ready to receive your blessings on all the fruits of the earth and whatsoever pertains to our bodily needs. And finally, let us pray for all those things which our Lord himself would teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
cross. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're a Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise.
read, The King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha! Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and the teachers of the religion, religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe in him. Even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah.
when Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. A word of trust. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. 